All current technology announced is actually old tech. When something gets discovered, it's often experimented on, exhausted and drained by governments and militaries long before it reaches the public. This isn't some conspiracy, it's fact. I know this because I'm one of the people tasked with development on things that are beyond what's currently public. My team and I were sent to a small country in Africa. It was a small state that was not on any public map. This made things easy to deny, and made hiding the less ethical projects much easier. It was decided long ago to never give the country a true identity. Its name changes every few years, so if two generations of workers decided to become whistleblowers, it'd sound like they were talking about two completely different things. Much harder for the tinfoil hats to piece things together. Some of the team jokingly nicknamed the place Wakanda, a current reference, and again, would be harder for conspiracists to take seriously. One of the top priorities we had was never letting the outside world get a whiff that we had an entire population secretly used for experimentation. Their whole existence was a lie, completely separated from the real world, observed carefully by the many outside forces that worked there under a shared agreement. The plus side was that they lived a life of luxury. They were the first to get all the beneficial technology we worked on. Tech that you're probably looking forward to seeing a decade from now, just handily available in their shops. I'm pretty sure they haven't had to touch a steering wheel in years, their streets looking like a less exaggerated interpretation of a sci-fi movie set in the future. Though this balance was sometimes superseded by the less than beneficial ideas in the works. It's pretty much universal opinion to be opposed to the idea of human experimentation. But realistically, there are many examples where testing on a small sample group of people could have prevented disaster. A perfect example of this was the rushed use of Agent Orange, a nerve agent used as a weapon. However, the long-term effects were not tested, and the repercussions of its use is still prevalent in the areas it was used. There are some examples that you'll never know about too. Did you know we found what was essentially a cure for cancer? It worked great for the first decade. However, after that, something came back. It wasn't cancer. It was worse. And it was contagious. Can you imagine if that was rushed to shelves upon discovery? We calculated a fifth of the population would have remained, namely nomad tribes far away from civilization. The experiment I helped lead had an ambitious goal. The idea conceived was to genetically enhance individuals for the benefit of society. The perfect genetics we found for imbuing the volunteer was that of an ant. With an ant's bolstered strength, enhanced constitution, and abnormal stamina, they would be the perfect workers. Manual labor injury and fatality rates would drop to nearly zero, plus the added healing factor would make the few injuries negligible. It wouldn't just be for work either. Their quality of life would improve drastically as well. Extended life, the energy to enjoy life, a massive reduction in genetic diseases like dementia and such. You'd just be yourself, but better. No matter what, the procedure would always physically change their appearance somewhat. The hybrids would develop small points behind the skin on their forehead, their bodies trying to replicate antennas. Their back and upper torso would swell, their frame accommodating their extra functions and strength. They also grew smaller bumps around their ribs, their bodies attempting to grow additional limbs. The biggest indicator of a hybrid is their skin, 
which would tint slightly with a dark purple hue. There were a number of positive benefits that we never fully calculated for. The hybrids no longer needed to breathe entirely with their mouth. The subjects started taking on the property of partially breathing through their skin, something which greatly helped the deep cave miners. The precious rocks they dug up being crucial to funding the offsets of our research. Our rocketing profits was an indicator at the continued success of the program. Minus the unwanted extras, for the most part, it was a success. However, it didn't take long to find a few bugs in the program. Something we didn't initially account for was the aggression. This, plus their amplified strength, caused a few caved-in skulls at a bar and a warpath that was only stopped by some heavy firepower. This wasn't an isolated incident. Despite the many setbacks, we were proud that, underneath it all, our subjects retained their humanity and memories. Our goal was to upgrade the human race, and it looked like it was becoming realised as a success in our eyes. With each praise of success that spread across the city, the more volunteers we received. We had it to the point where we were performing the procedure on a large test group every day, confident in the safety of it all. These volunteers naturally joined our workforce and turned into a small union of hard workers. They didn't mind the labour, as in their enhanced state, what was once a gruelling grind was now a brisk task. Imagine getting the wage of a dangerous job like working on an oil rig, when it just felt like you were flipping burgers at McDonald's. The hybrids were laughing down their sleeves to the bank. A small team of hybrids could outperform a legion of an army of ordinary human workers. I was proud. During my stay, I made friends with a local. I snuck him some contraband communication equipment that could only receive and send calls to a device only I owned. Basically, a glorified walkie-talkie. If I were to give a civilian in that country any sort of outside communication, they'd have my head. And that's not a figure of speech. I knew I wouldn't be kept in that city forever, and would be called back home to work more inland. If I was called away, everything here would then fall into confidential territory, and I'd never know how things fared when I'm gone. So I set this up as a way to secretly keep up with my baby project, which I cared so deeply about. Sadly, that time came sooner than I'd thought. One of the hybrid workers was hanging out in a small town on the outskirts of the closed-off country, which sometimes hosted some of the surrounding tribes that didn't adhere to any of the societies. They thought they were free, however, they were really just another harbour demographic for experimentation. Like before, a bar brawl broke out. It was normal for them to fight out their differences, a local belief that if you want to fight, their god favoured your opinion more. But as you can imagine, this was different. Our worker got into an altercation with one of the tribe's daughters. In private, he ended up ripping off her jaw and beat her to death with it. It wasn't hard to figure out the connotation of what happened and the obvious ramifications of his actions. The tribe declared war on our city. We knew it was political, and more a gesture that would warrant diplomacy, but the higher-ups prioritised us over them, and ordered an immediate evacuation of most scientists and important figures. They told us our work here was done anyway. The only positive takeaway was that the experiment was marked as a massive success. A few months at home went by with no word, and suddenly... I was barraged with contact. They personally told me they wanted me to head the task of making the product 
commercially viable. Despite the long time of silence, they were now practically trying to rush it out of the door. Their goal was that they wanted it to be open for anyone who volunteered. It seemed like an easy thing to sell too. Want to never be tired? Want to always be in shape without having to slave away at a gym? Want to be the safest you can possibly be in your own skin? The marketing team was having a field day at how easy this was going to be to sell. I was obviously excited. My hard work, years of study, years of working within this organization from the bottom up, years of working hard to get them to trust me, years of my life dedicated to wanting to help humanity was finally going to pay off. People dreamed that humans' next steps were in the stars, but I was going to show everyone it was within us the whole time. Work was hard. I helped tweak the formula for mass production. I even secretly cranked down the potency somewhat to hopefully alleviate any type of enhanced aggression. We were already on the testing process when I started feeling nostalgic about my first run in Africa. Upon contact, rather than the warm welcome I expected, I was instead met with a frantic rambling. He sounded like he was still moving and was trying his best to be as quiet as possible, but he managed to get enough out to explain what happened. It turns out, after we left, they carried on testing effects I never accounted for. The hive mind. Behind my back, another smaller team was siphoning information from my research to recreate the same process but with a queen ant. When the tribes declared a war, it gave them the excuse to try out a crueler intention of my work. What's worse was that it was a resounding success. All at once, anyone with a modification stood to attention and moved as one to converge. Imagine the perfect soldiers, all as one, all enhanced beyond human limitations, all following the omniscient command of a single leader. The tyrannical implications was disgusting. It didn't end there. After they wiped out the tribe at a disturbingly sinister pace, they then were set upon the city. Slowly, the team of workers, now scarily efficient killers, quickly made their way through the streets. They were upon the walls, climbing through the windows of the unbeknownst civilians. Only few got away, but they have nowhere to go. The whole country surrounded with many kill conditions to always keep them out of contact with the outside world. What remained was a city of ants. It wasn't hard to piece together what happened, why ants were chosen, why they somehow developed extra features I never accounted for, like antennae and thicker, near bulletproof skin. The objective the whole time was to make the most effective soldiers. Or worse, the perfect subservient population. I still showed up to work, now secretly armed with this knowledge. I kept my head down, and suddenly, there was an announcement that there was no tested negative side effects and the product was almost ready to be sent out. This announcement was done by the person who managed the whole team, the one who built up the dream team to go to the city. However now, he appeared different. His skin was far darker. He could have tried to make the excuse it was the African sun, but that would never explain the dark purple hue it carried. He was more hunched, a feature which was overshadowed by his severely inflated upper torso. I'd seen the procedure done hundreds of times, however, I never saw inflammation that big. The only thing I could liken it to 
was like comparing the larger thorax of a queen ant to a regular worker ant. I knew that despite secretly tweaking the formula to lower aggression, it would mean nothing if they were simply controlled. From here on out, I can only do my part by hindering the development process. I've secretly sabotaged parts of the process, setting things back weeks or sometimes months at a time. But more and more researchers are brought in, each learning everything from the files, and each slowly getting good enough to replace me. Or worse, realize what I've been doing. Past then, it's only a matter of time before the product is announced. If it is, do not volunteer. Fight it. Throughout my life, I've always struggled to sleep. This isn't because of any form of insomnia or procrastinating with games. It's because of the hands that talk to me from my closet. It started as whispers or groans, very light vocal sounds emanating from the echoey wood of my closet. It was often hard to decipher what they were saying but the most common word I picked up was help. As you would expect, I would cry out for my parents each time this happened. Through sobs, I'd explain in the most detail I could for a child, and they'd let me stay with them for the rest of the night. However, that was the extent of recognition I got. They drummed up my tales to a child's imagination. I got talks of being a big boy and I had to grow out of this habit. Though I did grow out of the crying, the voices never outgrew me. Nearly every night I'd hear their mutterings, taunting me to exhaustion. This was also the age I started asking to have friends over. My parents were ecstatic that I was taking an interest in being social and heavily encouraged it. These nights would give me a semblance of peace, sometimes. I don't know how they knew, but some nights they'd pick up that my friends were in a deep sleep and that I wasn't. These conditions were hell. Hearing these ominous sounds whilst my friends were blissfully unaware of the potential danger they were in, I felt guilty about it. However, it was worse when the voices no longer cared whether they were asleep and tried to hail their attention. It wasn't long for my friends to start politely declining my invites to stay over, their mortified faces carrying their true feelings. Moving house never helped. That was a traumatic moment. When I'd freshly moved into the room I'd spend the rest of my childhood in, a hopeful feeling and I would escape the torture I'd endured prior, only for whispers and groans to remind me of the nightmare I lived in. As the years went by, the voices became more coherent. When I heard their mutterings, each night carried a different voice, something I ignored for the most part. Sometimes I asked them to leave, which they'd sadly accept until one memorable night. I was woken one night by a meek voice. She sounded confused, scared. She stuttered. He Hello? Is anyone there? I'm scared. It's dark. I don't know what to do. Can anyone hear me? I usually try to ignore them but this voice warmed me. I tried to be polite. I replied, Sorry, I can't help. Sorry. 
At hearing my voice, she responded to me. Oh, okay. I guess I'll just live in pain. It hurts so much. My heart sank. What made me feel worse was how she never responded past then. Though there were no more voices, that night I especially didn't sleep well. That voice was one of the more friendlier ones. One night, I was ready to nod off, and just as I felt I was about to slip away, I was jolted awake by a sound. It was a soft slam on wood. I bolted awake, cautious. Then came the screaming. The voices of what sounded to be a middle-aged lady was wailing from my closet, muffled by the sounds of my clothes and the walls. She screamed in every way she could for me to help her, for me to get her out of there as fast as I could. The urgency made me neither fall into fight or flight, rather, I just froze for a bit. The panicked wail never let up, so I tried to talk to her. I assured her, as I did many times previously, that sadly I had no way of helping. However, this time was different. The slams from before returned, getting louder and louder, jolting my door increasingly with each hit. All hope in my heart screamed for the door to stay shut. To my shock, it didn't. It opened just wide enough for a limb to slip through. A hand. Once out, it fell to the floor, just barely sticking out of the gap, outreached but limp. The voice was more clearer now, though the screaming stopped. Her voice was raspy, but it didn't sound like her natural tone more like a rasp from her excessive screaming. She groaned for help. Please, help. I want to leave. It hurts here. I don't want to be here anymore. Please. I didn't know what to do. I was just about learning to handle the voices, but the hand made me quiver at the invasion. I stayed in silence, too stunned to move or speak. After a while of pleading, silence rang. After a while more, the hand gently slipped back in the closet and the doors softly closed. I was left shaking, more terrified than before. I didn't sleep that night. Sadly, that wasn't a one-off experience. Each night carried a different voice, a different attitude. There was a voice that rang around my room one night. Annoyingly, it woke me from a good dream. He sounded older, with a deep, authoritative voice. He started strong, asking me nice, inquisitive questions. Hey kid. Are you in school? How are you finding it? Do you have many friends? I didn't recognize it then, but those nice questions soon turned into sly coercion. Have you been taught to be good? If someone asked for your help, would you help them? Do you want to be a hero? All yes yes questions, a classic salesman tactic designed to make you answer yes to all the obvious probes and trick you into agreeing to do something for them. I tensed up when the voice showed a slight sign of impatience. He scowled at me, taking too long on one question, which set me on edge for the rest of the conversation. His tone turned aggressive, fading away with obscenities and my brattish nature. That night left me sulking. In the mornings, 
there was never any evidence of anything that transpired the previous night. I confronted my parents through a white lie, telling them my old closet kept me up at night with its creaking. I persuaded them to let me install a lock. It was a logical option. No matter how strong the arms were, they'd never be able to break durable metal. My father and I set to drilling the pilot holes and screwing in the new lock setup. It was a simple padlock system. My dad wasn't much of a handyman, but we relished in the shared experience. I tested it after my dad left me alone, and I was rough. I rattled it as hard as I could, testing how much give there was. But in the end, I was satisfied with the results. I was almost looking forward to seeing the hands next try to wake me. My feelings of intelligence got a grim reminder of its limitation when the voice was back. They woke me by calling out for me. I played along, politely replying, hoping the lock would send a message. But when the arm pushed, gently at first, and was denied entry, everything got frantic. The voice became aggressive, screaming at me things I'd never heard other kids say. All the while, the arm bashed on the wood like an impatient solicitor. The rattling sound of metal giving off an additional menacing vibe. This wasn't kept up when the hand calmed down and pined at the door like a cat, gently clawing with its long sounding fingernails. This was far more foreboding and disturbing than a flaccid arm on my floor, all the while whispering many promises that they'd get rid of all my bodies, they could make me popular at school, they would do all my homework, many tantalizing things a kid would die for and more. I curled up and silently wept through the night. Past then, I never used the lock again. I never really told anyone about these experiences. When I half-baked the idea into conversation, I'd be met with mixed feelings of disbelief and furrowed brows, more so at my mental well-being than any kind of sympathy. This is why, when I met my girlfriend, Jamie, I never told her about it. We started dating near the end of my time at college. By this point, I was staying up most nights studying and working on too many projects that care about the hands. They never much liked coming out during the day, so this nocturnal sleep cycle was the most peaceful time of my life. I met Jamie in an extra course I took and we hit it off straight away. Though we were both busy with college, so we took things easy. This is why, when she invited me over during a time we were both less busy, I snapped up the chance. I'd never held up a relationship before due to my tired and constantly depressed demeanor due to the strange nightly activities. So in a setting where that mentality was the norm, I finally had my chance to fit in. We studied together, playing off each other's notes. It was great and very motivating compared to the solitude of doing it alone. We studied through the night and not long after crashed in bed. It was late at night, closer to when she slept. So this is why, when I awoke to some quiet whispers, I wasn't shocked. The mutterings went on, gently waking me from my slumber. The echoes making it sound like it was coming from her closet. However, a detail about it made me jolt awake in realization. The voice wasn't from the closet. It was Jamie's. She was asking someone if they needed help in a tone like she was talking to a child. 
I quickly turned and yelled at her to stop. I wanted to tell her to back away, to never entertain the hands games, to never go near them. But I could barely give out a yell before I saw her gently caress the palm of the child's hand, poking out the closet out of curiosity. That was all it took. At the brief moment of contact, the fingers gripped around her at the same time as snapping back, and at an inhuman pace, she was pulled in. It lasted less than a second, probably breaking many of her bones in the process. The door snapped open and shut, just fast enough for Jamie to be pulled in one motion. The split second revealing many different arms, all congealed together at the back of the closet, writhing together as a mass entity. Jamie being consumed whole. What happened after the door closed? I do not know. The only way I can liken the predatory speed is like a crocodile basking in the sun on a river's bed. When any sort of sensation brisks the inside of their mouth, they snap and roll, brutally twisting its victims into the water. That night was one of the first nights I'd ever been truly left alone by the hand. But there was no peace that night. The police report was hard to make, but I managed to withhold enough details to present myself as sane, whilst also giving enough information to make myself non-compliant. I quietly finished the rest of college, opting to stick by myself for the rest of the term. Each night still presents a new hand, accompanied by a different voice and a different personality. Though, the arm sticks out that little bit more now. It's up to the shoulder. I've learned to deal with it for the most part, except for some nights when a unique voice rings out and a familiar arm gently rests on the carpet I laid out for them. Those nights I sit by the door, gently talking to the voice. She never directly responds only talking about the pain she's in and that she needs my help. During these nights, I feel so guilty. Sometimes when I'm staring at what remains of Jamie, I wonder if it'll be better to go in with her. In my spare time, I browse Reddit a lot. I don't just mindlessly scroll through memes for Reddit, but rather I enjoy the more community-based forums. My love for unsolved mysteries took me to r slash unsolved mysteries. I was also fascinated by the amazing work identifying strange objects on r slash what is this thing. This naturally drew me to the subreddit r slash what's in this thing r slash what's in this thing is about people finding strange containers or storage devices of any kind, then asking for help on opening them. I've seen things ranging from hidden rooms to secret encrypted hard drives. If you catch these early, and the person putting forward their query plays nice and updates frequently, you can ride an amazing adventure of problem solving and gratification. Even if the contents found is lackluster, there's a rewarding feeling in success that's hard to describe if you haven't tried it, as the journey more than makes up for it. It took a while, but eventually the posts started getting a bit stale for me. Too many times had I seen a safe or a hard drive, 
a great introduction when it was someone's first time. However, personally, it started getting a bit repetitive. What reignited my interest was actually a post on the other subreddit, r slash what is this thing. The post was made by an old guy from Solihull, England. They were searching their house when they found a box they didn't recognise. They posted pictures, followed by the limited information they could provide. The pictures showed what looked to be a small, ornate box. It was covered in gems that looked precious in nature. However, they weren't all cut evenly, showing it was done by hand. It appeared aged, hinting at historical value, yet its high quality materials preserved it fantastically. On its face were a number of tiles, each had what looked like strange runes on them. Upon request, the old guy confirmed they moved. He also noted some stranger detail. The box was cold to the touch, something which should be normal for a metal and gem covered box. However, he admitted that in his age, he often had the heating on high, and he held the box for long periods of time while inspecting it which he stated should have warmed it up, at least a bit. But no, it was always cold, no matter what. The weirder thing he found was that when he held it, if he concentrated on his touch and focused in the silence, he could swear he felt it vibrating, just ever so slightly. The only definitive found was that it seemed to be a puzzle box. However, everything else was shrouded in mystery. Something to note about r slash what is this thing is that a number of experts in a wide variety of fields frequent it. I've seen them solve the most obscure of things from a strange microscopic creature which someone found through their microscope to a strange piece of paper handed through a door with an obscure demonic looking symbol on it. The subreddit seemed bulletproof, until this mystery. Despite what felt like infinite wisdom of the collective, no one had any constructive input. There were a heap of probable suggestions. History buffs took stabs at trying to pinpoint an origin, some suggesting wide, unspecific areas, and others poking guesses at some lost civilizations. None of them could come to a consensus. It got even more mysterious when the language experts debated the possible origin of the runes, which didn't seem to match any known records, not even looking related to any known dead languages. But that one detail, the fact that it was a puzzle box, naturally made the mystery migrate to r slash what's in this thing. Here, new questions were asked, and new experts arrived. At first, we had to chase away the idiots who suggested brute force. To even contemplate damaging what could be a huge historical find was completely stupid. This made everyone resolve for the harder option. Solving the puzzle. First, were the language experts, they tried to correlate the runes to each other, trying to find any kind of pattern. Just when they thought they found a correlation between two remote symbols, adding a third seemed to mess things up. They could never make it past two, making the plot thicken. Tech heads ran the symbols through various algorithms to see if a neural network could decode a pattern. The computers each gave various solutions, and to the credit of the old man, who had the hard task of somehow rearranging the tiles perfectly to each suggested solution, he posted pictures each time, showing the box not opening. The great plus side was that this old man seemed to have all the time in the world, and entertained many of our ideas and requests, though in some posts he seemed reluctant to share details seemingly distrusting, probably due to the few people trying to swindle him out of the box. In the meantime, 
he did a lot of tinkering himself. To our surprise, progress was made. Not by any of the fancy equipments at the community's disposal, or the wisdom of experts, but by the simple playing around of the old man. He started posting pictures of shapes he made with the tiles, all from just pottering about while he was bored. From here, progress boomed. Though it never looked fully formed when he showed it at first, it looked like the strange runes were both ancient letters, and they doubled as a pattern, which hinted at a shape. However, no matter how much the community tinkered, no one could make any headway, except him. His updates picked up in frequency, each posted picture looking more and more complete. He posted a picture of it almost complete, just the last few tiles out of place. It looked like a few more shuffles, and it would be done. We were ecstatic. We were already practically high-fiving each other in the comments, and we all waited in anticipation. Some ended up going to bed, opting to find out in the morning, whilst others, like myself, sat there and anxiously refreshed through the night, waiting for the results to be posted. In the meantime, the comments filled up with fun conversation about theories of its contents, some pessimistically trying to avoid an anticlimactic reality by subverting expectation that it was nothing. We waited in joy through the night. However, I ended up begrudgingly leaving for sleep at the late hours. But some still stayed up, too excited to sleep. When I woke up, I was surprised when I found nothing. The comments were getting antsy. We waited, and waited, and waited, and waited. It was slowly starting to sink in that there was possibly not going to be an update. No one knew the old guy, so no one could physically check on him. Efforts to comb through his post history to find his identity failed. Everyone's hope hung like the Sword of Damocles, hanging precariously over our heads, each falling one by one when we hit a sad level of acceptance, not resulting in an outburst of rage, but rather a quiet whisper of disappointment. Past then, the subreddit fell back to normalcy, working together to open the unopenable. The joy was still there, and we all seemed to move on. Until, a few months later, when a post caught our attention and sparked some underlying feelings. A young person based in Central America posted about an anomalous item they found. While changing some pipes in their house, a worker found something strange. A box ornate in nature. It was covered in uneven yet valuable looking gems, implying it predated automated tools. As you can tell, this looked all too familiar. The page was bombed with a series of backlash from the many people who felt scorned from the previous experience. This resulted in the page getting removed, being suspected as a possible viral promotion or an ARG. But when it was reposted in a serious tone to r slash unsolved mysteries, some of us migrated to start the journey once more. For a start, it wasn't identical to the previous box. The face which held the sliding tiles was now a solid plate with a continued pattern of the ornate stones, matching the rest of the side of the box. However, now, on the front was a dial, similar to that of an old safe. Rather than numbers at sequential five-click intervals, there were more strange symbols. What was strange was that they never matched any of the symbols on the previous box. Yet, 
they look to be of the same origin. Similar to seeing the first half of the alphabet separate to the second half and knowing they're of the same source. On the side, we made a separate chat room on Discord, in case any more posts got removed, which would have deleted our progress. Whilst we brainstormed suggestions, the owner got to doing their own thing. Organically, they reported similar findings to the previous mystery. The box always being cold, despite them living in a very warm climate. They also noted the strange feeling they got when they pressed hard on its face, describing it as a faint buzz from within. We all put our heads together and started providing possible solutions. At first trying to work from the patterns and findings from before, then moving onto original ideas. Whilst we worked in the background, the original poster also experimented away. He found that he could find the first symbol when something within the box clicked, which seemed to be an indicator for a correct input. The first was always the easiest to get. However, it wasn't easy to keep consistent. This is because it was different each time. Something none of us had seen before on a safe style system. When playing around more, he started consistently getting the second combination correct. Again, always a different symbol, but a memorable pattern. We noted down his findings, seeing if we could figure out a third. But nothing we ever tried worked. The next update made a few people leave. Not because of what was said, but more how it looked. It was a positive update. He explained that he had made a string of successful progressions, how he found a consistent pattern and had chased the correct combinations up to the fourth digit. He went on to say he felt the fifth would be the last because of the sound each correct input made. He described the first as a light click, but the further he got, the heavier the sound felt until it was a heavy clunk. It's not that people lost interest at this, but rather it rubbed people the wrong way and how similar this post echoed the pattern of the previous box owner. Still, we held hope. The chat room in private, discussing how the previous person was old and therefore may not have known the subreddit's etiquette of posting the results. Or maybe he found something he wanted to keep to himself in his age, possibly thinking we were all evil as were the messages drilled into the early adopters of the internet. But this new guy was young. He was more in touch. If you searched his reddit history, you could see he knew how to interact, and seemed to follow good internet etiquette. His updates were always in a more open language, seemingly welcome to the help, and an appreciation for the dedicated community that followed him. It came to the night where he said he was going to crack it. Following his pattern of success, it seemed like he was close. He had hit the fourth digit many times, and had tried twisting both directions to many different symbols. Only a few remained. He posted some private videos of a few of his attempts. The possibility of success was so close we could taste it. The night droned on and we all sat in call together, joking away, discussing possible ideas of the contents. Maybe these boxes held parts of some unknown or lost treasure. We scared each other by suggesting that maybe the old man was too scared to share its contents, or maybe he greedily kept it because it was so significant. Our shining hope was the fact that the guy we were waiting on seemed to crave the recognition of the box's opening subtly making jabs at the anticlimactic ending of the previous adventure. We waited through the night. One by one, people left to go to bed. We waited through the morning, more people dropping off, whilst people who slept prior woke early for the spectacle. We waited until the early afternoon, where the late sleepers joined back. We waited until the evening, where the exhausted people who never left 
slowly passed out at their desks. Eventually, the call went dead, and we all defeatedly left. In the end, there was nothing. It was even more heartbreaking the second time. The old adage of, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, ringing around our emotions. It actually kind of hurt, this feeling of betrayal. The only positive was that most of the chat room stayed in touch, having formed a bond through these strange experiences. A few months later, and this all brings me to now. I was going through some old boxes to clear away some space under my bed, partly inspired by Marie Kondo. Most of what I choose to part with was stacks of old papers that had no more meaning in my life, but one box was particularly heavier than the rest. When I peeked inside, my eyes widened and my breath audibly escaped me in shock. There was a strange, ornate box. Each gem looked beautiful and pure, yet imperfect from each other showing it was handmade, but with care. Looking closer, I could see the hint of chisel marks, meticulously done to create dynamic shapes. It appeared old, yet it glowed with a pristine shine that comes from only the highest quality metal. It was tantalizing to the touch, the feeling of pride washing over me for handling something so valuable. I can only liken it to being in the presence of a supercar, feeling the desire to touch it out of curiosity, but never roughly in the dire fear of damage. Knowing what to look for, I caressed its sides, feeling its cool features. I held it tightly as I studied it, subtly trying to warm it with my body heat, yet never succeeding. No matter how long I waited, it was always cold in my hands. But one thing I did notice was the slight rumble it contained. The whole duration I held it, I felt the familiarly described hum. However, feeling it in person showed that none of the others ever gave this strange sensation justice. And I don't think I could either. Not knowing where to turn, I immediately went to the Discord room and tried to explain the strange thing that happened. Immediately, people left, leaving remarks about how a marketer had infiltrated the group, the ones that got to know me a bit, feeling betrayed somewhat. However, like before, the dedicated ones stayed, choosing to help me upon seeing the many pictures of proof I posted. This box held its differences from the other two. It didn't hold a panel of sliding tiles in the top, nor did it house a dial in the front, but rather, under the entire front lip were a series of rollers, similar to what you'd see on a business person's suitcase. There were eight in total, each containing matching symbols in an identical sequence to each other. Like before, None of the runes matched anything we recorded on the other two boxes. We worked diligently, with no luck. It wasn't until we were stumped, and I just sat there playing with it, when a feeling of intuition kicked in. My mind was creating ideas and patterns I never knew I could comprehend. I tried variations and combinations with a newfound level of creativity, yet never truly knowing what I was doing. After puttering for an afternoon, I heard an affirmative click, indicating some sort of success. Similar to before, the first one was the easiest to get, though each time it never stayed the same. It took a long time, but soon enough, I was cracking the second, then the third, then the fourth digit, then the fifth. Each click sounding crunchier than the last, 
giving a sense of progress. Along with that feeling of progress, another feeling swam in the back of my mind. I could feel the vibrations of the box and the humming within. Each time I got closer to the solution, I could swear I felt whatever was inside getting excited. That's the only way I can describe it. When concentrating on touch alone, I don't think its frequency had ever changed, but it felt like something I could sense, like it was passing that feeling onto me. The positive emotion having a sour taste when I pictured that its origin was not my own. It was either that, or I was simply projecting my own excitement at finally being able to see what's inside. The longer I worked at it, the more something in the back of my head screamed at me to stop. The previous experiences setting off many red flags that this was possibly dangerous. However, I feel I've gotten too far to not see a payoff. To me, whatever happens is worth it. Whatever happens. I'm on the seventh digit now. I've tried posting this on r slash what is this thing and r slash what's in this thing, but it was immediately nuked. I've sent a copy of this to some personal friends and the chat room I'm in. I'm also posting this on YouTube, as I feel it's one of the last places this will be accepted. I'm going to complete the eighth digit. After that, I'm going to post the results. If I do, then we can all marvel at what's inside. If this ends here, take it as a warning of the worst scenario possible. Every year there's a must buy for Valentine's Day, and this year was a new box of chocolates. Valentine's Day draws out many different crowds, but every time it's the same. You get the forever alone people that fervently complain about being alone on the holiday, which ironically is a horribly unattractive trait, thus reinforcing that they will be alone for the holiday. You get the negative Nancys, who are mad at the holiday for being so couple enforced, seemingly ignoring the fact that you can just spend time with a close friend or family. And don't get me started on the Valentine's Day is a hallmark holiday people that seem to think the commercialization automatically erases any sense of sincerity that can be achieved on the day. This is in contrast to the die-hard fanatics that want to go hard on everything for the holiday. And though I love her to pieces, Sadly, Megan, the girl I'm dating, falls into this category. Though we've both grown up since our younger puppy love days, where every day had to be special, she still loves to be spoiled on Valentine's Day. So, when a local advertisement made its rounds that this year's must-have was Heart of Chocolates, the most cliche-looking Valentine's chocolate bundle I'd ever seen, Megan had to have them. They were advertised to be the latest in chocolate innovation. The fillings were these small brown balls of flavour, touted to be the new truffle, but much more affordable. All the details were heavily pushed in all the local ads and posters plastered across our town. She more than hinted that this was what she wanted. And you know what? I was actually ecstatic about it. To me, chocolate was much more affordable than some limited edition jewellery that'll only be worn for a day, or a huge, overpriced bear that would very quickly merge into the pile of plushies she kept. Chocolate was usually seen as a cop-out gift, so the fact that she asked for it was a godsend to me. A sentiment that some of my other friends thought too. 
I happily promised to get her a box and told her we'd have a fun day together. The only problem was, my friends and I weren't the only ones to pick up on this great deal and the queues ran around the block in most of the stores that stocked the chocolates. Every man and dog was getting them as an easy, affordable, yet thoughtful gift this year. So most stores immediately ran out of stock. Whoever ran this company's marketing department was damn good at their jobs. I ended up having to do a bit of research to try snag a box. It turned out the company behind these chocolates were a local pop-up company that seemingly opened overnight. This was their debut product and timed it perfectly to cash in on Valentine's Day. Their PR was perfect. They created a perceived value similar to what made Apple such an appealing company. The status of the item had a feeling of exclusivity on top of the quality of the item itself. In the end of the day, it was just chocolate. Just like an iPhone is just a phone. But the inherent notion of owning it held status value and bragging rights. Sadly, because they were just situated in our town, it meant I couldn't just skip over to the city and find a heavily stocked store. So my friends and I hopped in my car and we did the rounds to all the stores that received stock. We bounced around store to store, asking staff the question that must have burned their ears all week. We'd occasionally look out and find a store with one left. Because I was the driver, I let them have first dibs. Or rather, they twisted my arm into that deal. I guess they figured that if I got a box, I'd be less inclined to drive them around. Which was true, and I was their only ride. Eventually, everyone had one. Except me. I dropped them all home. The irony being that they no longer wanted to stick around since they already had a box and left me alone to search for one myself. I wasn't mad since we did this kind of stuff to each other all the time. I carried on bouncing around town, confident I could snag a last minute batch. However, the later things dragged on, the more I realised it wasn't going to happen. My confidence got the better of me, and it bit me in the ass. I was devastated, because I knew she'd be devastated. It didn't help that, despite the company's best attempts to create enough stock for demand, they were still a new company, so stock was awfully limited. I tried calling the company and asking if they stocked any stores in other towns. I was ready to do a long run. However, they simply told me this run was exclusive to our town. I presumed they were using their home turf as a testing ground. Valentine's Day came, and I had to face the music. I gently let Megan know the truth, that I simply couldn't get the chocolates in time, though not from lack of trying. Her response took me by surprise. She wasn't mad or upset, though I optimistically hoped for that. But on top of that, she was happy. She had heard the effort I went through and was happy at the gesture more than the product. I was ecstatic. This motivated me to make the day I had planned even more special, and we ended up having a great time. While we were having a nice dinner date, I checked my messages. On top of the group chat that often flared with messages, I got a private message from one of the friends I drove around. He told me he was the one who tipped off Megan about her escapades, and he and his girlfriend had a great idea. They would save half the box for me to give to Megan the day after. I politely asked them if they were sure and he simply told me his girlfriend wanted it out of curiosity and was happy with just trying some. So, with that in mind, I carried on with my date and sneakily never told Megan, ready to surprise her. 
The morning after, Megan was more than happy. We had hit a high point in our relationship, which she admitted to me. This made me feel even more excited that I had a chance to add more to this emotional fire we were stoking. She left for work, and I timed it so my friend would drop off the box without Megan's knowledge. He came quickly and handed them to me, neatly rewrapped to make it more presentable. I asked him where his girlfriend was, and he told me she wasn't feeling too well. Knowing he'd be alone and wanting to make up for the favour, I asked if he wanted to hang out. He told me he was starting to come down with something as well, and opted to leave. I shot him a quip that I'd make up for this favour in the future, which he gave a grin and left. I hid them in plain sight, and played around for the rest of the day, waiting for Megan to get off. When she eventually did come home, a few hours later than she should have, she was exhausted. She was in a rut, saying over and over that she felt like she had to work 10 people's jobs. Apparently, there were a lot of no-shows that day, since a lot of people called in sick. There were rumours something was going around, but she just chalked it up to post-Valentine's Day hangovers. Her mood flipped when she saw it. I straight away wanted to tell her the truth, so I could explain why I never gave her the chocolates to her on Valentine's Day, and why the box was half empty. But before I could even get a word out, she screamed in disgust. She slammed it shut, and put it back down in haste. This took me back. I didn't think it was that bad to have a hand-me-down. She scowled in anger towards me, shooting me with an accusatory look. I asked her what was wrong. Confusion plastered across my face. When she saw me confused, her anger devolved to a matching level of confusion. All she told me was to look inside, but to be careful. I slowly peeked inside and immediately slammed it shut. Some of the chocolates had small blemishes on top, and from each one were tiny brown beads gently wriggling themselves free from their cage. The easier ones to see were the chocolate shells that were cracked and had freed their wriggling prisoners. I didn't look for long, but that was enough to see there were small, chocolate-coloured little worms that were hidden within each bite-sized piece of chocolate. I didn't look for long, but that was enough to see there were small, chocolate-coloured little worms that were hidden within each bite-sized piece of chocolate. They looked infantile in nature. I was mortified. I confirmed what I saw, giving detail without thinking, causing Megan to run to the bathroom, a heaving sound accompanying her. I grabbed the nearest roll of tape and took to wrapping the box a thousand times over. While mindlessly trying to secure the box, a thought came to my head and I flicked on the TV. On every local channel, there were news reports doing big exposés on the Heart of Chocolate product and its company. There were calls of a town-wide emergency, and all authorities were on high alert. Though, they were also reporting that the emergency services were woefully understaffed for the pandemic due to a large number of workers were also infected by the chocolates. When Megan returned, we sat there and watched everything unfold. The evening started with talks of quarantine and riots, and things progressed through the night to the borders of our town being shut off and a form of martial law trying to keep the peace. All the while, I was keeping an eye on social media. I saw updates that my friends fell victim to the illness. A lot of them 
either taken to the hospital or complaining at how long the emergency services were taking to get to them. It was pandemonium. Everyone was terrified for their safety. I held Megan close, but in my head, I didn't know if it was for her comfort or mine. The last thing we saw on TV was a shot of an interviewer in an ER room. He was showing the aftermath of the effects of the chocolate, doing a deep dive on the symptoms people were feeling. Phrases like intense stomach pains, nausea, uncontrollable vomiting, headaches, scrolled past the screen. There were even weirder symptoms that were reported. Psychological ones, like hearing a constant wriggling, or even hearing strange voices. One person even stated it was the unmistakable voice of a deceased loved one. No one knew what to make of any of it. People were becoming delusional. And this was only if the victim could talk. Some were falling into a comatose state, barely responding to any stimulus. Suddenly, there was a scream from down the hall, followed by the cameraman letting out an audible gasp. This left the anchor confused. A look of annoyance at the unprofessional disruption from what should have been a silent cameraman. But that was because the cameraman could see what was coming, whereas the news anchor could not. Behind the anchor was a figure slowly stumbling towards him. His neck was disturbingly bent back, his mouth open at an inhuman girth. From his throat, was a large, wriggling mass, which when closer, looked like the tip of a large worm. It looked extremely uncomfortable, however, the figure didn't seem bothered. The way he moved, it looked like he wasn't in any sort of control, acting like he was moving on some sort of unconscious instinct. I wasn't even sure if he could breathe. Before the anchor had the initiative to turn around, it was too late. The figure grabbed the anchor's hair with an ungodly strength and yanked his head back, forcing his mouth open. Before he could let out any scream, the writhing head of the worm bent down and vomited a mass of small, brown dots. Megan looked away, not knowing what was going on but my mind instantly made the connection. The dots were reminiscent to the egg-like dots that were baked into the chocolates, the mystery unraveling far too late for me to do anything about. The shot cut after the camera swung back, indicating the cameraman's upper body was also yanked back. This left the screen on a high-pitched whine, and the visuals Nothing but a TV color test screen. No more broadcasts were shown after that. I told Megan to stay put and rushed into the garage to grab any and all hardware supplies I could carry. I boarded up all the windows and doors on the lower floor, just about having enough wood and nails to do so. I made sure we turned off all the lights and sealed the windows with fabric and tape. I emphasized many times over for her to never make a sound and to keep all lights off, no matter what. She was terrified, but compliant, taking my grave tone seriously. She thought of me as acting out of bravery, but I never let on that it was actually fueled by fear and also a hidden motivation. In the brief moment I looked out the garage window, I saw a glimpse of what was going on outside. I saw the fires of panic, people rushing around in fear. I saw people lying on the ground, passed out. Standing above them were figures with their heads impossibly snapped back, 
arriving brown point wriggling in success. After seeing what happened to the anchor, it wasn't hard to figure out what happened to the unconscious people. My goal was to never let us see what was going on outside, and to keep whatever was outside from seeing us. I hear the tearing of helicopters above, and the chatter of military sounding radios in the street. Occasionally, there's the clatter of gunfire, but from the screams, I have no idea who's winning. All we can do is wait. Every year, around mid-February, I always seem to have a bug problem. I could never figure out where they'd get in. I assumed there were small gaps in the door frames or windows that I couldn't see, but was big enough for these small critters to get in. Though there were a variety, they were often ants. When I saw the first signs of them this year, I stepped on some and left them hoping their dead bodies would send a message. It didn't. Each day I left the problem, it only got worse. On the way home from work, I passed by a local corner store where I sometimes picked up small things like eggs and milk. While browsing the section of home chemicals, detergents, washing powder and the like, lo and behold, there was a cheap, white label, no name brand bug spray on sale. It was perfect. I couldn't fathom how a good brand of bug spray would differ from a cheap one. If anything, cheap items didn't adhere well to legal guidelines, often going overboard to be too effective, encouraging people to buy them. So, in the back of my head, I hoped it would be way over the legal poison limit. When I got home, I took to guessing where they got in, I sprayed around all my lower floor window frames and around the front and back door. That night, I went to bed smug, looking forward to seeing some dead black dots in the morning. I woke up and sleepily went to check on the areas where I sprayed. What I saw left me dismayed. In the shape of spray marks were swarms of insects all feasting away on the liquid. It hurt my head trying to fathom the strange sight before me, but then a theory popped in my head. Maybe it was one of those poisons that's sweet and encourages the workers to take it back to their nests and kills the queen. This theory solidified when I thought about how much that made sense and hoped it would be resolved when I returned from work. I left with a sinister smile and went to work. When I got home, I had to take a wide step over the pile of insects that were gathered in front of my door. More had came. They were falling over each other, all of them fighting at the bit to get to the sweet nectar they craved. Annoyed, I picked up the spray bottle and spritzed them excessively. A lot of the bugs at the centre of the pile drowned. In my inexperienced thoughts, I figured they were fighting over the scraps, so if I gave them enough, they'd stop fighting and finally take it back to their nests. I spent the rest of the evening trying to ignore the writhing masses that formed around the house and living life as normal. I woke up, dreading the idea of checking the progress. I went downstairs and my fears were confirmed. Writhing around the wall and doors were hordes of the little critters, now filling the space the extra liquid spread to. They were so dense it looked larger than life, like one big entity that made camp in my house, 
a living black tar roiling around the edges of every exit. When I looked closer, or at least as close as I dared get, I could see they were all still feasting away, ignorant to the drowned bodies of their fallen comrades from the night before. Annoyed, I resolved that the spray I got was cheap for a reason and went to throw it away, ready to make the haul to the big store after work to get a name brand product. However, as I picked up the cheap nasty bottle, admittedly with a heavy grip fueled by anger, it burst at the slightest touch of pressure. My eyes reflexively closed, as all at once I was covered in a cold liquid which ran down me, then across me, then up, then down again, and around. When I slowly opened my eyes, I saw why. I wasn't just covered in the strange sticky liquid, I was also coated in a thin layer of black. Bugs had somehow gotten into the less than high quality seal of the bottle and started drinking away at the oh so desirable liquid from the source. These ambitious bugs somehow filled the bottle to breaking point, crushing a lot of them, as evident by the disgustingly crippled, unmoving bugs that were stuck to me. But worse were the ones that were alive, ignorant to the fact they were on a titan of death to them, more concerned about drinking that alluring tonic. I don't know whether it was some pheromone from the crushed dead bugs or the chemicals of the spray, but in its concentration, it was pungent. It smelled like a wood-scented candle, but with a chemical aftertaste. I rushed to the shower, almost hurting myself with how recklessly fast I ran, and washed away as much as I could, whilst uncontrollably sobbing at the situation. I didn't like bugs at the best of times, however this was overwhelming. Even as the black ran off me, the thick layer of them falling like liquid, I was not satisfied. I washed and washed and washed. I was in there for almost an hour, giving myself no time to eat before work, though my loss of appetite would have prevented that anyway. When I stepped out and dried up, I could still smell the faint aroma of the spray. It seemed stuck to me for the time being. Still, I had to go to work. While walking to the subway, I was getting a series of weird looks. This was because of the strange movements I was making. I'd feel a small tickling sensation, so I'd reflexively swat at it. When I would look at my hand, there'd be a dead bug. But others didn't see this. Only my weird jerking and flailing. I didn't want to cause a scene, but it kept incessantly happening. However, this is only the reason people were weirded out by me. There were other people that were disgusted. This happened when someone looked at my direction, and just as we locked eyes, a small black dot would dart across me. If it were on my skin, it'd often be too fast for me to catch them. It was worse on my clothes, where I couldn't feel where they were. I could only feel the disgusted vibe of the carriage. It started getting to me. At the chance of catching a bug, I started wailing on myself, stomping on them repeatedly if one landed on the floor. People scrambled to get out the cart, the younger passengers filming me and my freak out. I tried keeping calm at work and decided to treat myself for lunch. This was an easy feat in my head. There was one food place I adored that was my go-to for lunch. A cute little family-owned cafe. This bliss didn't last long and the place was evacuated after a quick string of bug complaints. When the kitchen was inspected, they found a series of health hazards, all relating to pests. They closed for the day, maybe even for good. 
I felt guilty as I watched the family break down, their business in ruin so fast. They thanked me for all my years as a customer when I passed them. I didn't have the heart to tell them this all happened because of me. At work, it didn't take long to be sent home early after there were a number of complaints from co-workers. I looked down from my screen, which I was engrossed in at that point, and saw them marching ants around my desk, all clambering over each other to make a bridge tilting off my desk and towards my chair. I could see people muttering to each other as I was escorted out, snide remarks I didn't need to hear shot in my direction. Because of the early time I was heading home, the subway carriage I was in was almost empty. It was surreal to me, as I'd only ever used the subway during peak time, when they were packed with other 9-to-5 workers, all droning back and forth from our jobs. I nervously looked around the carriage, staring at the many empty seats, all in an effort to avert my gaze from the one passenger with me. My only company was a meek-looking girl. Despite the vast emptiness of the carriage, she was sat dead next to me, her face almost pressed against mine, her gaze locked in my direction. I couldn't figure out if I should be flattered or worried. The timing confused me more, as it was Valentine's Day. An image that she was lonely for the day and was craving company on the companion-themed Hallmark holiday popped in my head. But in contrast, I also thought she might have been less than subtle at watching the insects nest across me. She had a curious look on her face in the brief moments I glimpsed in her direction. It was a cute, wide-eyed look, as though she was trying her best to memorize this experience. Eventually, I caved in and tried conversing. I nervously choked out a greeting. However, she didn't respond at first. She just opened her mouth in a trance. She almost looked like she was salivating at the lips. And I don't mean that in a guy way. I mean, inside her mouth was saliva visibly pooling a little bit around her tongue. Being introverted, I wasn't used to this kind of attention. If it even was attention, one could get used to. I nervously asked when she was getting off, trying to cut the tension. Her only response was the phrase, Whenever you are, in a darker than expected tone. This hit me as a red flag to leave. At my stop, I dipped out the carriage where she followed. I picked up my pace, hastily trying to exit the subway. She followed suit. I shot back an open comment for her to leave me alone, which fell on deaf ears. When I looked back, she had an almost hypnotized look in her eyes, lustful for something I couldn't quite figure out. When I exited the building and turned the corner, I took the blind spot as a chance to start running, hoping she'd take that as a strong hint that I wasn't interested in anything to do with her. I flicked my head back to see how much distance I gained, and panic made me run faster when I saw she had the same idea and was now following suit, sprinting right behind me. This made me pick up my pace. I was no longer trying to get away from an awkward social interaction, and was now trying to run from something much worse. As in the brief moment I looked back, she seemed different. Behind the skin on her cheeks, I could see the protrusions of what looked to be strange mandibles. Her maw was open and twisting in an impossible way. Her eyes were glazed over in an almost gloss black. What terrified me more was that she was surprisingly fast for a girl with such a thin frame. 
I managed to slam my front door shut in time before the heavier than expected crash of the girl followed. Between slams, which pushed the door open ever so slightly, I managed to flick the lock, bolting the door closed. Any semblance of feeling secure slipped away when I heard the banging stop and her scuttling footsteps slip away. Soon, there were scratching sounds from my window. I didn't hesitate to trudge through the now piled mass of bugs to be greeted by a disturbing image through the glass. Her face was contorted to a twisted visage of an insect, yet still retained human features. A disgusting hybrid which had no place on this earth. The only thing stopping me from freezing in fright was the comfort of her being behind the glass. As long as she remained on the other side, I felt safe. I flicked my window's lock for security, which made her dart away again. This time I knew where she was going and headed in the same direction. I was greeted by a twisted image in the next window. Between the bugs pooling on my windowsill, I flicked that lock too. This turned into a cat and mouse chase around my house until we were back at the front door. There, she started bashing again, the wood creaking with each hit. I slid down, sitting in the writhing blackness that was pooling around the bottom. It was horrifying to do, yet it was bearable knowing my body weight was helping keep the threat outside from getting in. What's worse was that by sitting in the puddle, I realized I got more of that mysterious liquid on me, something she immediately picked up on and sent her more into a frenzy. Suddenly, a meek voice sounded from outside between the slams. She was pleading with me to let her in. She described how tantalizing I smelt and that she just wanted a taste. Admittedly, that would have been an alluring offer if the situation were different. I never entertained her offer, forcing her to try a new angle. All she said was that she was going to find a way in, no matter what, in an ominous tone. It wasn't hard to figure out what she meant. I heard shuffling, but this time, upwards. I pictured her clambering up the guttering, and knew I had a bedroom window up there. In a flash, I darted up the stairs into the window. I almost slipped back when I saw her, not expecting to see her so clearly outside. She was staring in, while her arm, now bent in a strange way, was clambering at the seal. Once I regained my balance, I flicked the lock, and the chase began once more. I followed the shuffling around, window to window, when something hit me. There wasn't guttering all around the house, yet she was making the rounds as fast as I was. Out of one window, I took a peek and saw how she was getting around. It wasn't just her arm that was bent at a strange angle. It was all her limbs. They were now all arched over, clinging to the wall like an insect. I watched her gain a head start as she scuttled across my wall to the next window. However, I managed to lock it before she made any progress. Once we lapped again, she scuttled back down, leaving me to press up against the front door once more. I took this time to slip out my phone brushing away the pile of bugs that crawled inside my pocket and called the police. I felt I couldn't tell the full story, so I settled on telling them a crazy person was trying to get in my house. This was reinforced by the heavy bashing on my door, which echoed through the call. They promised to act fast, and I was left to hold the fort. Each minute that went by felt stretched out. By the time the police arrived, I was in tears, covered in the uncomfortable writhing of the insects I was sitting on. As I heard the car pull up, I heard the frantic scuttling of the lady slip away. I heard the police knock urgently, which I answered, 
wiping my face. In front of me were two police officers, a male and female. I urgently told them the crazy person was nearby. Once they saw I was okay, the woman nodded at the guy and he set off to look for the assailant. She remarked about my condition. I was haggard, insects making their home all over me. I looked in a state. She looked hesitant at first, seeing the condition of the entryway of my house. However, she showed a duty and asked if she could come in. Looking to be assured, I gladly accepted. As soon as she put one foot in, she leaned closer to me. I let her inspect me, feeling there might have been an important detail on me for the investigation. She leaned her head closer to the insects, closer to my body. To my surprise, all she did was take in a small, sharp sniff. She took it in and leaned back with a look of contemplation. In a curious tone, all she said was that I smelled good. They called it the Anubis Experiment, a perfectly ominous name for its purpose, temporarily killing people in an insane attempt at contacting God. As it turns out, succeeding was the worst possible outcome for the project, and as their first and only subject, I was able to find the answers we so desperately sought after. 20 minutes would be all I got. One of the more eccentric doctors at the facility had invented a new drug. He explained it as an antimetotic intravenous coolant, something to stop my cells from dying. Not that these words meant anything to me. I was clueless, but ever so willing. It sounds crazy, willingly putting myself so close to the edge of life with no safety guarantee. But... After my diagnosis with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, I was desperate for answers. My body was rapidly deteriorating, taking away parts of myself day by day. I had already lost the use of my legs, and eventually I'd be unable to feed myself or even breathe. The questions I had about the afterlife would be answered with the help of Dr. Mueller a man resembling more of a Frankenstein character rather than a legitimate medical doctor. He was as eccentric as he was genius. With a promise of answers to the ultimate question, alongside a handsome paycheck, I was quick to sign up. I received a phone call from Dr. Mueller himself only hours after signing up for the experiment, speed never before seen at any regular clinic. He requested that I meet with a psychiatrist who would check out my mental state, weeding out any suicidal candidates and religious nuts. On the day of the experiment, I was hooked up to more cables than I had available skin service. Various machines I couldn't even begin to understand were set up around me, providing alerting beeps to notify everyone that I was still alive. They would need to perform a craniotomy during the experiment, opening up my skull and prodding around with electrodes to see if there was any activity going on while I was put under. Mueller held a small needle with a clear liquid. I thought it funny how I had expected something more obvious to kill me. Perhaps a giant device containing green bubbly fluid that glowed in the dark or something to that effect. As it was, it just seemed a bit anticlimactic. This is going to hurt a lot. This is your last chance to turn back, Mueller said, calmly, knowing full well I wouldn't give up. I had signed all the papers, 
and was fully briefed on the procedure, the discomfort, the rehab, and the time I would spend being put under a microscope, having every aspect of my being investigated. Pain was not something I feared, but dying without answers would be pure torture. But you already shaved my head, I joked. If I was going to die, I wanted my last words to at least be amusing ones. Nobody seemed to share that sentiment. Without further ado, they injected the substance into my arm. The second the liquid entered my veins, it burned like a colony of fire ants had crawled their way beneath my skin. Only a few seconds passed before my heart stopped. A moment of pain ensued, and then darkness. People always talk about the white, blinding light they see during near-death experiences, the ecstatic feeling of peace and being back with loved ones. That's not what I experienced. I simply floated around in an endless void, unhinged from the concept of time and space, not existing nor worrying about getting back to life. Minutes, days, years could have passed, and after an eternity in the void, I was jolted further into the beyond. Heaven or hell, I had moved onto the wrong side of life. The afterlife took the shape of a dimly lit room. I was standing up wearing the hospital gown I had died in, but my legs functioned again. I could move around on my own, as if my disease never existed. I hadn't walked in over a year, but I wasn't joyful about it. In fact, I couldn't experience any emotion. I simply existed within the endlessly large room, not scared, curious, angry, nothing. My naked feet felt wet as I moved across the floor. I couldn't recognize what it was made of, but it was soft and pulsated beneath me with each step. The way the room lit up was peculiar. There were no identifiable source of light, but everything appeared equally bright, as if each surface was lit up on its own. One spot shined brighter than the rest, a number written on the ceiling. 4,815,162,341. As I moved around, it became clear that the walls and ceilings narrowed in, to the point where it was no larger than a shipping container. In the confusion, I hadn't noticed the singular piece of furniture decorating the place a bizarre chair made of flesh and bones. In the chair sat a young boy, emaciated, barely clinging onto life. Black tendrils connected him to the surrounding environment, with peristaltic movements surging away from him. The whole place was feeding off the child. Being there and seeing such a weak representation of life almost made me forget that I had just been killed, yet I was unable to feel anything for the sickly looking boy. Hello? I asked quietly. The child lifted his head towards me. His eyes were wide in a mixture of fear and surprise. How did he get here? He asked in a shaking voice. I... I am not entirely sure. I think I'm dead. I stuttered back. The words felt unreal as I spoke them. My memory was hazy. I could vaguely recall the experiment I participated in and the lethal injection Mueller gave me. But it seemed more like a faint dream than a crucial part of my life. You're... One of them? He asked 
nervously. One of... I couldn't finish. Somehow he knew what I was about to say. You're not supposed to be here. They'll find us. He got up from the chair, tearing the tendrils as he broke free, a thick black liquid flowing out from each end. He seemed surprisingly agile, considering he consisted mostly of skin and bone. We have to get out of here. If you found your way here, they could have followed you. What? Wait, who are they? The creators. The boy pulled on my arm. His touch burned through my skin. I could feel the sensation of burning flesh, yet I couldn't feel the pain. Somehow, the imprint looked nothing like the hand that had touched me. It was a strange symbol I couldn't decipher. Hurry! We ran straight towards the wall, and as we approached, it simply retracted into itself, breaking apart to form a doorway, like with the tendrils, black goo oozed from the tears. The hallways inside were dark and moist, with barely enough space for an adult to bend over to get through. For each step, and every time I leaned against the wall to support myself, it pulsated, twitching reflexively with any movement. After a short run, we eventually entered a room exactly like the first one, except the number now read 4 billion 815,162,342. Are we safe here? No, but it'll buy us some time. So, who exactly are we hiding from? Who are you? The child looked saddened by my question. I'm sorry, I did my best to hide you. Hide me? No. All of you. Humanity. What are you talking about? Shh. The child listened intently to the hallway we had just emerged from. The living wall was growing back over it, leaving no trace that a passageway had ever existed. Who are you? Without answering, the child grabbed my arm again, at exactly the same spot as before. Only this time... I could feel the burning sensation flowing through my veins, radiating up towards my neck. I felt joy unlike anything in my actual life, and suddenly I knew what he wanted to tell me. For one moment, I both felt and knew everything. You are God? I half asked, half stated. That's just one of the many names bestowed upon me by my own creation, but I am not an infinite being like you believe. Why do you look like a child? Perception. Your mind created this form. My mind was racing. I couldn't even begin to process the answer to each question as they poured out of my mouth. What about heaven? Hell? Is this the afterlife? The boy laughed. There is no heaven, nor hell. That's a fantasy created by humanity. I made you because I believed you could be like me. But the creators had other plans. This is why I've been hiding you for so long. What plans? Because you are nothing more than slaves. And as soon as you finished your time on earth... You are used as spare parts so that the creators can exist in a physical form. They are so powerful, but wish for nothing more than to live and feel everything that comes with being human. They need both your energy, which you've creatively called a soul, and the remains. But I've been able to keep at least your energy hidden. How? By destroying it before it could reach me. I'm not sure how you got here. Maybe it's simply not your time. Or maybe someone sent you here on purpose. But... Before I could keep my questionnaire going, I was interrupted. No more questions until you answer one of mine. That statement made me stop in my tracks. 
What could God possibly need to know from a nobody such as myself? How did you get here? Huh? Oh, th there was an experiment. Some doctor injected me with a drug that temporarily kills me. Why would you agree to that? They wanted me to find God. They wanted to find you. You fool. That's a horrible mistake. How could you not see? Anger and disappointment lit up in his eyes, burning through my soul like raging fire. The shame and self-loathing it awoke in me was unprecedented. I didn't have to ask any more questions. The information was being forced into my mind. Unrelenting amounts of knowledge occupying my every thought. Despite being dead, the pain was still ever so real. God showed me the face of the creators. He showed me what they do with us after we die. They take what remains, our souls, our flesh, and it allows them to temporarily walk among us on earth, disguised as friends, co-workers, politicians, and doctors with a penchant for obsessive experiments. Do not tell them anything would be the last words he ever spoke to me. No sooner had he spoken these words before something jolted me away, pulling me back through the void with incredible force, and before I could process what was happening, I awoke with a gasp in my own body, lying in a hospital bed, back in the real world. You're awake, Dr. Mueller exclaimed in joy as he saw me open my eyes. Though I hadn't been dead long, 19 minutes to be exact, the experiment put me into a coma for three weeks following the injection. I didn't speak, just kept my mouth shut while I tried to figure out if it had all been a vivid nightmare. They did all sorts of cognitive tests during the next couple of days, making sure my brain hadn't melted due to the 19 minutes of death I experienced. Whatever their machines did, they detected a lot of activity while I was under. Things they wouldn't see in an average dead individual. For weeks after my physical health was established, they prodded and asked for anything. But I did as the child had told me. I kept silent, only providing unimportant details about what I saw. I told them there was a light that I felt at peace and all the other mumbo jumbo people say at a near death experience. Eventually they gave up and sent me home, telling me they would stay in touch and to call if I could remember anything useful. Until I got home, I couldn't be sure whether the whole ordeal had been a creation of my own dying mind or if it had truly happened. But one thing I brought back with me from the afterlife was the ability to walk. There's no cure for ALS, but somehow my body had healed. In fact, that didn't remain hidden for long. The miracle of regaining my ability to walk and all quickly gained some media attention. So I took what little money I saved up and started running, hoping that they the creators wouldn't find me. The only way to get away from them is to die, to let God destroy my soul. A year ago, I would have happily killed myself to escape whatever torture they have ready for me. But death has become a terrifying concept. Because I know there's nothing left for us on the other side.
you will be hard pressed to find someone who hasn't heard of the Bloody Mary game. Though there are a few variations floating around, you will mostly find kids telling someone at a sleepover to say Bloody Mary in front of a dimly lit mirror three times, the rumour being that she'll appear. She never does. There's a reason for this. Everything you know is only a part of the ritual, started by people who knew all the steps and felt the Asker didn't have what it took to complete it. A few rumours, and it's the widespread urban legend it is today. Nowadays, very few remember how to perform the full ritual, or even know that there is one. To begin, you'll need a few things. Some easy to get household items, and some ingredients that will be harder to get. Starting from the easiest, you'll need something that will represent Mary. It's recommended to use a humanoid shaped object, a plushie, a doll, or even a bear. Feel free to weave straw into a human shape. That's how they did it in olden times. A mirror. This will have to be one kept in your house. Don't worry about pedantics, like if it's a silver coated back or not. Some optional tools, things like a fire starter kit, matches, a lighter, etc. A source of water, any liquid will do. You can even improvise some tools too. Learn all the steps and see if you can come up with some creative tools. A tool to extract blood. And a place to keep samples of blood. Whether it's rough or clean is up to your discretion. But whatever it is, you'll need it for the harder to attain ingredients. For the harder to get ingredients, you'll need four samples of blood. Your own. This is the easiest to get. Your family. A friend. And an enemy. You'll only need about a drop of each. How you go about this is up to you. However, something to note. They have to be alive before and during the game. Some games can last a long time. So choose people who have years left, not months. To prepare for the game, place a dab of each sample of blood on each corner of the mirror. Do not worry about the shape of the mirror, as long as you place four separate dots in a square shape. Next, take your tools, the vessel and blood with you to a remote area far from your house. It's recommended not to start too close or it may make the game much harder to complete. Once you find a suitable spot, put a drop of your family, friend and enemy's blood on the vessel. Never your own. That'll mean you lose immediately. Do whatever it takes in your power to never let this happen. Once the blood has made contact, the game begins and she will arrive. Mary will appear somewhere at random, just outside roughly a 30 foot radius, in an unknown direction. Be wary of your movements, make no loud noises, be as hidden as possible. Your first goal is to get home. She will try any means to find you. She'll sneak, float and drift around the place, quietly inspecting the area. You can never get too complacent. She always has a sense of the vessel you have, so she'll always have a sense of your direction. But it's important to keep the vessel with you at all times. Never let it go. Mary will be easy to recognize. She's a young woman with deathly pale skin. Her blackened hair hangs precariously around her. She has a thin, almost emaciated frame, but don't let that fool you. No matter how strong you may be, you won't be able to overpower her. And worse, because of her light frame, she's deceptively fast. She cannot be killed, as in essence, she's a spectre. Her only ties to this world is the vessel you hold. 
She's tied to it in a strange way, but a way you can take advantage of. You may find yourself in a precarious situation. Say you need to go through a funneled path, fenced on either side, or an alleyway between some houses. A place where there's only A and B, and no other way to escape. What if she's waiting on the other side? What if she chases you, and you're not confident you can get to the other side in time? This is where the lighter comes in. Set part of the vessel on fire. As long as the vessel is on fire, so is she. In this flaming merry state, she'll be frantically darting around in pain. She's then easy to see, easy to hear. Use this to predict the timing to run through the area. This trick will make her movement predictable, but there are some drawbacks. As stated, she can't die. Also, though she's easier to see while on fire, so will you when you're holding what's essentially a flaming torch. There have been times where Mary has overcame her pain upon seeing the player holding their flaming vessel and attacked them viciously, driven to work fast because of the pain. If you choose to do this, be conscious not to drop the vessel if it burns you. You also have to be careful not to abuse this trick. If you burn the vessel too much and you miss part of it falling off, the vessel is no longer complete. You can make the arduous journey to the end, complete all the steps to win, and find the game still going on. This is because, as long as that piece remains out there in the world, the game doesn't end. You will have to go back out and find it. What's worse is if she gets the fallen piece. If she does, consider the game lost. I have no way of helping you get it back. Like with fire, you can play with other things. Dipping the vessel's head in water can make it hard for her to see. In this state, for her, it'll be like trying to keep her eyes open underwater. Even if she does manage to do it, her vision will still be impaired. This is useful for scenarios where she's gotten too close, searching thoroughly, and your hiding spot isn't very good. Though be careful of abusing this trick too. If you make a pattern of it, she may pick up that her vision gets mysteriously impaired when she's coincidentally around you, prompting her to give up less easily. It's not smart to become predictable. This rule is especially true when you're trying to get home. It's recommended to not just make a beeline straight to your house. If she picks up you're always heading in one particular direction, she'll try cut you off. Her goal is to find your house before you, and either guard it or stop you from getting in. Make unpredictable movements. Keep a map and route towards a building, acting like it's your destination. Then, when she senses you're ahead of you, switch it up. You can never truly lose her, as she'll always have sense of when the vessel moves too far from her. But this will make her less hesitant about camping a building. You have to find balance. If you play around like this too long, you'll risk getting exhausted. The longer the game goes on, the more chance you have of slipping up. However, if you're too quick, It'll be like lighting a neon sign above your house, and she'll catch you out immediately. This is why I recommended earlier not to start near your house. If you start out rushing to get in to win, it'll be more like a game of chance than a game you can plan to win. With her speed, you don't want to challenge her to a race. If she makes it to your house first and guards it, the game becomes many times harder. She will never let up. As long as you can't get in your house, the game goes on. Games have lasted years like this. The player trying to bait her out, 
but she's smart, she's patient, and she has all the time in the world. You will never outweigh her. Some have tried fleeing, to lead a normal life elsewhere, but this only lowers their guard. Again, this is where her patience is her strong suit. She'll always have a general knowledge of your whereabouts. She'll stalk you from a distance, scoping out whether you fled as a trick or not. At their most vulnerable, the moment they take a shower, just as they're rubbing shampoo out of their eyes, the moment they turn off their lights to go to bed, the moment they find themselves alone on a remote road between cities, she'll strike. So, what do you do if she gets to your house first? Kill yourself? No, that means you lose. You don't want to lose. Losing isn't just for you, it's for the loved ones you bargained too. You took blood from family, a friend, and an enemy. Without you, she has free reign over your bargaining chips. I do not wish half of what you do to your loved ones are my worst of kin, and I wish for 10% of the graces she'll bestow on your enemies. That's a common saying for the people who know of the full ritual. Maybe the people you love will happen upon the worst of accidents, and your enemy will get a mysterious inheritance. Her imagination is limitless. Too much for me to speculate. But I bet you can line up some interesting historical misfortunes and triumphs to the results of this ritual. Another stipulation to think about is that when a game lasts a long time, never let any of your chips die. That can be just as bad as killing yourself. One time, a game lasted a few years. Whilst working hard, the player's beloved family member they bargained passed away. Imagine the previous fail state, but with you and the family member's stead. This is why good planning is a must. But, these conditions about you dying or your bet becoming null, these are all scenarios in which the challenge becomes void. How does Mary win? It's simple. She has to complete the ritual. You essentially completed 90% of the ritual when you placed the four drops of blood on the mirror and the three drops on the vessel. All she has to do is get a drop of your blood on the vessel and it'll be complete. Once the ritual is complete, you've given her everything. All your memories, memories of your family, of your friends, and of your enemies. She'll take you over as a new vessel, as gifted by you. She'll live your life and lead everyone you've cared about to ruin, whilst leading everyone you hate to great success and power. But none of this has to happen. You can still win. And best of all, you've known how to win this whole time. To do this, you have to get home, stand in front of your bloodstained mirror, hold the cursed vessel in view, stare at your reflection and say, Bloody Mary, three times. This will dispel Mary and any traces of her evil. You have won. So, what's your prize? It's simple. Power. Everyone close to you, your family, your friends, anyone you care about, will all come into good fortune. Happiness will reign for the rest of your lives. Your enemies will royal in failure and pain, never knowing it was all caused because they crossed you. As you may tell, this ritual was from an era where family status was law. Bring power to your family whilst taking down your enemies was the mantra of this time. The family on top ruled. During these eras, some families would harbour a child 
and train them their whole life for this ritual, whispering false encouragement that they were doing this for the good of the land, family duty being drilled into them since birth, unbeknownst that they were just a sacrificial lamb for their desire for power. It was a time where someone claiming you were a friend was a chance to bring you great fortunes or untold ruin. Even though we're out of these eras, the idea of family, friends and enemies is still prevalent. So, if you feel up for the task, then go ahead and try this out. I've never been a stickler for other people's safety, unlike the few others who know of this game. But no, the chance of great reward is prefaced with a chance of great failure. There are so many known facets of the government that it's hard to know about all of them. What's a more terrifying thought are the secret ones, only told on a need-to-know basis. For a brief period of my life, I became a part of one of them. Throughout school, I was an in-betweener. I never hung out with the popular kids, but I never got bullied for being a nerd. I had a few close friends and never became acquainted with many others outside of that. We were tight. We'd mess about all day, saying the most random things teenagers come up with. Would you rathers, can you imagines and what would you do if scenarios were constantly on the tips of our tongues. Each idea presented always more bizarre and creative than the last. Would you rather have a teacher date your mom or another student? Can you imagine if everyone just started talking French? What would you do if every time you snapped your finger, you turned invisible? We were in IT class and spent the whole time muttering these stupid ideas to each other. It took one particularly loud giggle for the teacher to call us all out. He made us stand and specifically contribute to the discussion. The lesson was on internet security, and each of us had to present a way to be secure online, otherwise we'd get detention. One by one my friends rattle off an answer each. However, it didn't take me long to realise, the way we started, I'd be the last to answer, which meant they would have exhausted all the obvious answers. They rattle off things like an antivirus, covering your webcam, don't go on suspicious looking websites. By the time they rolled around to me, I froze. I had no idea what to say. So I just blurted out the first thing that rolled out of my mouth. This somehow translated to, I switched the keys around on my keyboard. It didn't take me long to realize how stupid that sounded. It didn't take long for everyone else either when chuckles erupted and a disgruntled look was strewn across the teacher's face. But then, his look carried a sinister smirk. Knowing he wanted to make an example of me instead of dismissing it as wrong, he asked me to elaborate, expecting me to dig myself deeper. I had no choice but to comply my nervous brain just stuttering anything out at this point. Years of improvising strange ideas came through in the weirdest way possible. I explained that every domestic ceiling has creatures that look at what you're typing and transcribe it for the governments to see. So, if you rearrange your keyboard, they won't know what you typed. The whole class exploded in laughter. Even my friends joined in, which reinforced how ridiculous the whole idea was. The only person who didn't seem amused was the teacher. However, he didn't look like he was annoyed at my non-serious response. Instead, he had a look of shock 
and revelation. Like I had just bestowed the location of the fountain of youth to him. He just stuttered out that I should go to the principal's office. The way he nervously said it made the other kids revel that I had just stuck it to the man, somehow sending the teacher into a frustrated shock. I was just confused more than anything. I waited outside the office for a while, though it was a lot longer than I expected. When I was finally asked to enter, the principal wasn't alone. Next to him were two nondescript looking adults that simply said they were auditing the meeting. The IT teacher came in soon after, now looking more exasperated. It seemed he was keeping in this panic the whole time and was finally allowed to show it. He aggressively heckled the principal to make me explain what happened. I was taken back. I didn't think what I said was that bad, but nonetheless I explained it in full, expecting him to slap me with detention for acting up. As soon as I finished, the anxiety took me over when this look of panic from the IT teacher spread to the principal's face and even hinted on the faces of the other two people as well. One of them piped in, asking me what made me say that. At this point, I felt I had accidentally said something somehow offensive, so I doubled down, hoping they thought I was just playing around. All I said was that they were sneaky, but I could see them. The two auditors completely dropped their facade at this, but rather than scold me, they started getting aggressive. Above the commotion, all I made out was the phrase, we're taking him, before more people ran in and grabbed me. I was quickly dragged away, barely having the thought to fight back in the confusion. Something was tightened around my eyes and I felt a sharp prick in my arm and very quickly, everything faded. It felt like I was only out for a second, but as soon as I woke up, I knew I was far from home. Around me were sterile clean walls, the furnishings in the room were sparse, but what tipped me off about the severity of my situation was the one wall, which looked like a large, thick panel of glass. On this transparent confinement, I could see a few holes, presumably for air, and a sliding hatch, which I later learned was for the delivery of items and food. I sat down on the single fold-out chair and took everything in. It didn't take long for panic to set in. The fluorescent light was a stark white, giving the room a cold feel. I sat there, hoping my waking would summon an explanation. I waited, sometimes making subtle movements to see if anyone would pick up on it. I waited more, tapping the glass every so often, hearing the sound echo down the dark hallway. I waited even more, contemplating kicking up a big stink. In the end, my patience wore thin and I started wailing on the glass. It started as a plea for attention, but soon turned into an emotional outlet for my pent-up frustration. The sound shook my cell and echoed around, but I stopped in my tracks when I heard a returning sound. There was another loud bang. It sounded like it was also glass. However, I was adamant it wasn't me. I stood there, still as can be, trying to locate the sound. Another hit resounded, then another. It was rhythmic. I looked around, however vision was skewed due to how dark the hallway was. The only thing I could make out was the gleam of more glass parallel to mine, which repeated down the hallway. This told me there were cells adjacent to mine, and more that ran down the hall. I sat back down in defeat when I realised what the sounds were. 
from what I could figure out, they were most likely other people trapped the same as me. The only difference was that they sat quietly, knowing there was no salvation. A defeat they passed on to me. For the rest of the day, I sat there. Night came in the form of the lights shutting off, and I went to bed and slept. When I woke, I was greeted to some people waiting for me. A few people in lab coats, and others in full military apparel. They demanded I lie down on my front and to put my hands behind my back. Desperate for human interaction and fearful of the situation, I complied. I watched as they somehow opened a spot in the glass which I didn't know held a door. The scene was almost too perfect to see with the naked eye. The military personnel rushed over and secured my hands and lifted me. From there, I was escorted with the rest of the staff down the hall. I looked around as I was walking and saw the population I shared cells with. One cell had a person, almost too emaciated to be called a human. A sign in front of his cell clearly instructed that he should never be touched with bare skin. Another cell housed a strange shape. As soon as I made it out, I looked away in denial. However, there was no wiping that image from my mind. It looked like a ball of flesh, writhing with moist, sticky clicks. I can only liken it to a mix of several people blended together what scared me more was that it was seemingly sentient. A series of eyes dotted around its form at random, all glaring at me as I passed. The last cell I managed to study was a strange one. A dark, clouded beam was centered in the room. It whisked and flowed with downward pouring smoke. Yet somehow, chains were bolted around the cell and all clasped various parts of the form. The last thing I managed to see before I was away from it were the shapes of facial features on the top of the form. By the time they sat me down in the interrogation room, I was shivering from fear and anxiety. The staff looked more frustrated at this than concerned, seemingly used to seeing these very alien sights to me. Once my anxieties fell enough to talk, they proceeded with the experiments. They asked me various strange questions. Who do you trust most in this world? What's your favorite color? What facial features do humans have? What's your favorite color? Is there anything currently hidden in the room? What's your favorite color? How many of them have you seen? What's your favorite color? They often repeated questions, though usually the more inane ones. They would sometimes skim over questions if I thought too long about them. Despite if I responded, there'd been many scribblings on their clipboards by the various scientists surrounding me. This was just one session of what turned into an age of strange interrogations, each weirder than the last. One time, they brought out various objects that looked like they were dragged from a dumpster. They told me to hold them and asked me what I saw. When I described them as best as I could, they took them off me, scorning me with a look of disappointment, as if I was supposed to see more. There was one session where they left me alone in the room. Instead of a scientist in the chair opposite to me, there was a full-length mirror propped up and made to look like I was being interviewed by myself. I swear there were brief moments I thought I saw my reflection accidentally move in the wrong direction and very quickly correct itself. They blindfolded me once during the escort and when I was instructed to remove it, I was standing in a perfect recreation 
of my bedroom. Everything was identical, from the layout to the details of dust I remember not cleaning. A voice over the intercom instructed me to look around, which I did. However, I must have not done it right, as not long after, someone stormed in and told me it wasn't working, and ordered me to leave. Every time I was brought into the interrogation room, I'd see more details of the detainees of the facility. Some of the monstrosities held there were beyond comprehension, and I don't mean that to escape describing them. I curiously glimpsed cells as I passed them, and sometimes my mind would feel like it was folding in on itself, forcing my eyes to cross in and out of focus. It seemed serious, because when one of the military personnel noticed my movements stuttering, he butted me with the edge of his rifle to snap me out of it, grabbed me, and thrust me forward to pass the cell faster. From then on, I tried my hardest to never look at that cell again. I still don't know how long I was held against my will, but eventually my time there came to an end. How it all ended wasn't some bizarre, life-threatening final procedure or a mishap with another cellmate. It was during a simple interrogation between me and a normal-looking scientist. He just put a laptop in front of me and watched me play around on it. When the session ended, he told me my time there was over. I tried to ask what this was all about, however, he just handily dodged everything I shot his way, something that was prevalent throughout my entire stay. There wasn't some grandiose ceremony or hard threats to stay quiet. In my youthful ignorance, my mouth shot faster than my mind, and I asked how they were going to keep me quiet. A question burning through my head, but I immediately regretted asking, feeling it as an implication that I was going to talk. What shocked me was the response. We don't care. Now curious, I begged them to explain. The scientist simply told me I was going to live my life as normal. I could tell anyone if I wanted but no one would believe me. I was drugged and dropped off in my hometown. I awoke in a bus shelter not far from my house next to a luggage case. It had my name on it, so I hazily dragged it back to my house, nervous about how my parents were going to react. I knocked on the door and waited. What proceeded was a heavily warm greeting from my whole family even members I didn't expect to see there. I asked why they were all gathered, and they responded that, apparently, I told them to. Supposedly, I informed the family that this was the day I finished the trip I went on. I had to get them to explain it to their confusion, but apparently it was orchestrated that I was deemed a prodigy in school and was needed at an academy for gifted children. At first, they were hysterical. However, soon accepted the situation when I constantly wrote home and left messages about my progress. I honestly feel they were so starved for attention that they blindly accepted any interaction with me as truth. However, I knew it wasn't me. But... No matter how much I tried to explain that, they just blew it off as a joke. A hint of fear sometimes lurking in their eyes as they did so. I took that as a hint to stop pressing. Everyone in my town seemed to be clued in on this explanation too. There were even small local news stories done on my progress at this school. To some, I was a local pride. I've tried bringing up what really happened, however, every time I'm handily dismissed. I tried going beyond my town and confessing everything online, but as they predicted, who would believe such a tall sounding tale? 
I've tried moving on. However, I can never get over being ignored about such a huge part of my life. I know no one will believe me, no matter where I post this. During the early 2000s, when there was a boom in the energy drink market, one company decided to join the competition. In this era, there was a lot of attention on energy drinks, brought on by their heavy sponsorships, notably in sports. While the giants like Red Bull, Monster and Rockstar battled, smaller grassroots companies popped up to try gain a foothold in the market space. One such company was named Maxium. Their pitch was simple. It was an energy drink for the common man. Rather than selling it on the idea of high octane caffeine, they sold it on the basis that it was like a sweeter morning coffee. Its unique angle made it an instant hit in the province it debuted in. People were lining up to stockpile on them, since it was less hassle than making cups of coffee throughout the day, and it was cheaper than going to Starbucks. People started hoarding them to ration through the day. This initially caused a shortage. Investments poured in, and production was ramped up. It didn't take long for the Maxim company to expand. For the brief period they reigned, they were on top. They were one of the top-selling beverages in their state, but this paradigm didn't last long. It started with some confusing business decisions. They started pumping heavy amounts of caffeine into a sports version of the product. There were shortages of the original Maxim Energy Drink in order to expand into the sports drink market. This obviously drove the common man market, the unique angle they hit, away. This new drink wasn't a hit, but for a reason beyond what you'd expect. The first reported case flew under the radar, seen as a one-off for a teen who irresponsibly chugged too much Maxim Sport. The kid was barely breathing, just about stable from his staggered hyperventilation. His heart rate was beyond normal for even high exertion exercise. He was eventually resuscitated, and that was that. Then, another case came in. Then another, then another. Each stranger than the last. Some of the smaller symptoms seemed in line with negative effects of such a product. A faster heart rate, excessive sweating, loss of focus. But these weren't the cases that were being rushed to the hospital. People were reporting to have experienced heart palpitations, uncontrollable vomiting, and extreme head pains. Just as the doctors had a grasp of the situation and started correlating a cause from the post-treatment interviews, more patients rolled in. One woman was preparing for a tennis game when her friends found her scratching at her face, screaming about the pain. When they finally wrestled her to stop, they watched as she broke down and wept, streams of red running from under her eyes. A student was staying up revising for an upcoming test when his mother walked in and found him having a seizure. She rushed him to the ER and explained the situation. What confused the staff was when she told them he didn't suffer from any form of epilepsy. Stranger yet, what they diagnosed was that the boy wasn't having a seizure at all, but rather, he was convulsing from a rapid amount of muscle spasms. They could only liken it to being electrocuted. His muscles were constantly firing off at such a rapid rate. After a big investigation spanning over a few months, it was found that the only correlation between these cases was the Maxim Sport energy drink. 
though they never found what specifically caused these various issues. It wasn't long for the company to shut down, having to pay a fortune in many legalities and medical bills. However, the story doesn't end here. All these reports that were published in journals, newspapers and on the TV were all the cases that were chosen to be publicly acknowledged. These reports were all the physical cases. There are some testimonies that are very hard to find, either through censorship or a lack of archiving, that flew under the public radar. They were most likely deemed too unrealistic for anyone reading the news to believe. These were the mentality symptoms. One patient was comatose for a few days. When she woke, she immediately fell into hysterics. She clawed at any nearby staff and had to be sedated. When staff finally got her to a state where she could coherently communicate, all she did was beg for death and for him to leave her alone. A few days later, she was found dead by her own hands. Authorities found a half-drank can of Maxim Sport in her car. A businessman was reported for his strange behavior. He cc'd everyone in his company complaining about a guy who kept following him, though it was hard to read the terribly typed sentences. The grammar hinted that he was shaking uncontrollably while typing. The last thing he typed was that he was going to chase after the guy next time he saw him since no one was helping him. He was found splattered on the pavement and his 15th story window smashed open. His secretary only noted about his screaming in his office, though she thought he was just grilling someone over the phone. The only other notable thing she pointed out was that she gave him the new Maxim Sport energy drink that he asked her to get. There were some reports that the police ended up dismissing during this period. Though they differ somewhat from each other, there was a common theme. Some individuals rang in, terrified for their lives, all complaining about a strange figure that stalked them. They described scenes of them trying to go to bed, only to see a shade in the corner. Once they focused on it, the shade got closer, until it revealed itself as a figure slowly floating towards them. His face was gaunt and twisted in a shape of pain. A common detail between these testimonies is the blood leaking down the left side of his head. Supposedly, the haunting figure only did one thing, repeatedly asked them to go to the Maxim factory. These complaints were only around during Maxim Sport's brief release and stopped soon after the company closed. There's a theory floating around online about this. Just after Maxim Sport's inception, a crucial founding member of the staff left. There were three main owners, two of them were heavy investors, and the third, Randall Walker, headed marketing. When Randall left, the other two took charge and radically changed the company. The other two were heavily into the idea of stepping into the sports drink market, as evident from their past postings on social media, and their enthusiasm for their new product, Maxim Sport. Randall, on the other hand, was the genius behind the original pitch and spearheaded the company into the spotlight. It's theorized that Randall didn't leave on good terms, despite what the other two owners fervently announced. Instead, it's thought that Randall was ousted when the other two confronted him about his promise of putting them in the energy drink scene. They wanted to be in the same market as Monster and Red Bull, oblivious to how well their unique product was doing in its open market space. This much is easy to discern if you read between the lines. However, the theories go deeper. One person on a now deleted blog claimed to have briefly worked security at the Maxim factory. 
One day, he was emailed to leave immediately and never come back to work. He only read it once he arrived to his shift. Initially, he was disappointed. However, no matter how much he thought back, he felt he had never done anything wrong, or at least egregious to be fired on the spot. This made him suspicious, so just before some people came to escort him out, he made a copy of the whole week's security footage on a USB stick and hid it. Once home, he combed through the files to see if anything was off. At first, everything worked fine. However, the closer he got to the night before, the worse the footage became. It flickered at intervals, sometimes jumping minutes ahead. It showed signs of heavy analog damage, despite it being fresh footage. The last thing he saw was a late night meeting between the three owners. By then, the footage was becoming hard to make out. It jumped around and flickered sporadically. However, the security guard just about noticed the two aggressors beat the third figure over the head, just before the image became full static. He saw them dump the fallen figure in one of the mixing bats, and static just rolled. This lines up to the report of an unidentified body found in the factory not long after. All identifiable features erased by the chemical the body was bathed in. The security guard yanked the USB stick out when, between the static, a strange, warped face kept flicking in and out. Its face was gaunt and twisted in pain. The only color was blood running down the left side of its face. When he reinserted the stick to try transfer the file, his computer showed the drive as white, the error stating the stick wasn't removed properly. It's unknown how much of this story can be verified. It's also unknown the whereabouts of Randall Walker. A lot of people accept the explanation that he moved far away with his large share of the money when he left at the height of the business. Most are more concerned about the many affected by the tainted final product, some still recovering to this day. However, the locals try their best to never bring any of this up, opting to want to forget it all, and hope this dark part of their town's history fades away. When I was called into the ER for a peculiar and disturbing case, I expected a mess of blood and gore that rivaled the Saw movies. Instead, I found a normal looking woman peacefully sleeping on the bed. Well, normal is a stretch. She would have looked completely normal, except for the fact that her abdomen was enormous. The skin was riddled with stretch marks, yet it was firm to the touch, not soft like fat. How long has she been sleeping? I asked the nurse, as I pulled my hair back. Oh, she's not sleeping, doctor. She's sedated. Sedated? We found her freezing to death in an alleyway, but when we tried to help her, she just kept screaming at us. Something about taking him away. She handed me a clipboard. Here's her blood work. I scanned the document. Iron, white cell count. It was all normal. Except for one little box. HCG positive. She's pregnant? Yep. I looked down at the woman. Her abdomen took up the entire width of the bed. Easily twice the size of the nine months pregnant women I'd see waddle in here. How... How far along? Fifteen months. Uh, what? That's impossible. Thump. 
The belly convulsed and shook with sudden ferocity, as if the thing inside had spasmed, or kicked, or thrown itself as hard as it could against the uterine wall. Don't believe me? Do an ultrasound. I rolled the equipment across the floor, grabbed the probe, slicked on some gel, and pressed it to her abdomen. The image, at first, was a mess of lines, bones, tissue. But as I pressed, I made out an immense round head, long limbs, large feet and hands. The ultrasound software estimated the baby was 19 pounds 6 ounces. Call Dr. Thompson in here for an emergency C-section, I whispered. The operation took 2 hours and 36 minutes. When the little boy came out, bloody and slimy, he didn't cry. He made a sputtering noise and then looked up at us with big green eyes. That's the largest baby I've ever delivered, Mr. Thompson said with a nervous laugh. He looked like a normal six month old baby, blonde curls matted with blood, a few teeth, thin maybe, but normal. Not knowing what else to do, we transferred him over to the paediatrician. His mother was still under anesthesia and woke up about an hour later. Where, where am I? She asked me. The nurse got her a fresh meal. The hospital. Her eyes widened and she glanced down at her abdomen, a mass of stretched skin that would hopefully shrink with time. No, no. Where is he? What did you do with him? We delivered him. I let out a small laugh. He was a little overdue, Margaret. Her face reflected pure panic. No, you don't understand. You freed him. You... What do you mean? He... He isn't a normal boy, she said, grabbing my arm. Her fingernails dug painfully into me. I was trying to keep him inside. So he couldn't be free. I didn't get much information out of her. I eventually transferred her to a psychiatrist and went home. But I couldn't sleep that night. Finally, I got out of bed, went to my computer and typed her name into Facebook. I was probably breaking a thousand doctor rules, but I didn't care. I found her page. Click. In her profile picture, she wasn't pregnant yet. She was thin, pretty, far from the pale, terrified woman on the hospital bed with a distended stomach. I clicked on the photo. That's when I saw the caption. From our trip to Vancouver, 29th of December, 2018. Not even two months ago.